So orchestration and abstraction are both narratives that become that became quite popular in the past couple of weeks in the crypto industry. And orchestration is really to yeah, put interoperability to the next level. So we have the technology and we have the infrastructure to for, for blockchains to be able to communicate with each other. We are able to transfer value between different blockchains. All of this works, but now we want to orchestrate that so that if you are a user, you do not feel all of the gaps that might exist in the um, in the in the context of interoperability. And besides, we also have abstraction because even though you are generally improved, especially in the cosmos, we still have the scenario that people have to open two times their wallet to sign a transaction or to connect their wallet to an interface to be able to execute simple swaps and so on and so forth. So most of the people that you know today that are not in crypto don't want to have this user experience and this is what abstraction is doing. Um, so to generally kick things off, to get like a very understanding what the ground laying issue is here, Jack, as mentioned in the intro, you're very familiar with all things interoperability in the cosmos. Why is it still so hard to build multi-chain applications? Because I mean, IBC is here, bridges are here, everyone is talking about a multi-chain future. Why do developers still have a hard time? Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent question. And I think a lot of it comes down to lessons learned in production. So just, just when we're talking about a world where there's hundreds and hundreds of different blockchains, like we're living in in the L2 world right now, there's a lot of pieces that are required to make an unstructured network like that work. And I think what we're seeing right now is app developers finally starting to explore the problem space of really building multi-chain applications. And that requires an entire new set of developer tools and user experiences that I, I think are really just finally coming to fruition in Cosmos. And I think this is actually one of the biggest moats we as an ecosystem have. Because we've made all of these, uh, built all of these things in production, we've been running them for so long, we've learned what those problems are and we've been able to like build solutions for them and overcome them in a way where other ecosystems that aren't as natively interoperable are just figuring out those problems right now for the first time. And, and they're doing it at a much larger scale where the mistakes are much harder and they're much, it's much harder to build solutions for, frankly. So, you know, I, I, you're right, it is hard right now, but it, stuff like IBC.fun, Packet Forward Middleware, all of these pieces that enable full-featured interoperability are finally in market and the UIs and the UXs are coming. And I think the other piece of it, and I'm gonna toss it over to Carol after this, um, is that we haven't had IBC connectivity everywhere we've needed it. And with things like Union now, IBC connectivity to the full spectrum of all the blockchains out there is right on the horizon. And with the launch of more things in Cosmos, you can go more places via IBC. And those have been really the missing pieces in my mind. Yeah, I largely agree with you there. Um, a, I think the Cosmos is not limited to just the Cosmos SDK. The definition is going to be everything that's IBC enabled, IBC connected. Really what we need to understand is the game is, or the fight is, uh, synchronous composability against asynchronous. Can we actually beat the UX that's available on Solana or Ethereum with contracts that live on the same state machine versus applications that live across different state machines? To actually uh, allow that, A, we need orchestration. We need to be able to connect all of them properly and write apps that basically allow us to make app chains money Legos. If we want to allow for this composability as well, we do need the same security level too. And that's really what IBC provides. Because if you truly want to make uh, these money Legos composable, developers can't have the cognitive overhead of needing to think about different intro protocols, different bridging layers. And the market itself also shouldn't need to handle the different risks associated with different bridging protocols. Because that would make the assets themselves non-fungible in the end. Um, and so that's why I think IBC is the one protocol to poise them all with many potential protocols built on top. Quite bullish on uh, Agoric for this. Yeah, so you said it quite well, Carol. So it, because you just mentioned Agoric, I just want to give the word to, to Dean to wrap the orchestration part kind of uh, up. So you guys are doing a lot of work. So actually, you are the biggest pusher of the orchestration narrative. So I would like to, to 
I would like to ask you if you could mention a couple of things that you guys are doing on that. So, um, for example, the async await functionality, the multi-block um, execution, the timer. So, if you could briefly touch base on that, so we know. You've got one. You've got no, one. No, no, it's, it's your okay. Phone. Okay. Right. Be careful. Awesome. Turn that. Move yours a little way. So. Um, so next month, or not next month, yeah, March, uh, will be the, the uh, launch of our orchestration API. You know, you, you talked about what's hard about orchestration, what's hard about doing multi-chain applications. The big thing is it is in an async world, right? It is, you know, because of all the connectivity we've created, we've created modular, we've created app chains, and that's created, you know, hundreds if not thousands of independent points of interest that people would like to be able to access pretty uniformly. And so the, the execution model that, that Agoric brings to it is, in some sense, the familiar JavaScript execution model, right? Millions of developers build Web2 applications all the time. It is the orchestration language of Web2 that controls trillions of dollars every day, right? On Bloomberg Terminal, Salesforce, you know, all, all these things. And it is the ability to say, okay, osmosis.unbond, that's a 14-day process. Wait for that, and then the very next line of code is now send that money over to, uh, to um, uh, uh, through Axelar to Ave, and when that's done, go put it in some pool over there. Or unbond there, move it back, trade it for Tia, move it over to Celestia, stake it, turn that over to STTIA, go put that in a vault, mint IST against that, and go buy something. Now imagine trying to explain to even a competent trader how many actions they would have needed to do something that users expect to click button and have happen. And they can see the status and it moves along and it happens, but that level of quote complexity happens every time you swipe a credit card in a, in a uh, foreign country, right? We've gotta be able to do that, we've gotta be able to do that easily, and it's really hard because of the async nature, because you send something and it might be seconds later, it might be minutes later, it might be two weeks from now that you went, then wanna continue something. And in the meantime, three of those chains have upgraded, right? So the world is a complicated place we need a lot more support to deliver simple solutions for users. And that's, that's what our A orchestration API is coming out, and that the engine allows this, this you know, multi-block action because there's no cross-chain app, there's no cross-chain request that happens within a block, right? You can't, in five seconds, do a round trip to another chain because you've got to wait for it to get published, you've got to wait for it to go around, you've got to wait for it to come back. So every operation in the new future is not within a block, it's a cross-block, and so having a multi-block uh, you know, having a contract operation that can span multiple blocks is essential to the future, not just useful. You mentioned it quite well. This is the engine that powers all of uh, that powers all of these interactions. I think that's a very good way to put it. But then there's another um, aspect that we have to look at, and this is the end user. And it might be that even though all of this works, the end user is confronted with different wallets, with different transactions, with different commands. So even, even like a very simple, um, simple example, if you want to trade a kind of exotic token on Uniswap, you first have to accept and pay a small gas fee in order to be able to trade it. And I think a lot of people who are not used to crypto at all might be a little bit overwhelmed with that. So um, my question for you now is, is this like kind of where we see the merge with orchestration abstraction so that abstraction is for the end user, orchestration is for the developers, or what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, for end users, it's too much right now of like, okay, this is not just what I want to do, but how I'm going to do it. Like when you want to trade even something as simple as ETH for Solana, let's just say, that's a massive multi-step process that involves multiple wallets, bridge at least, maybe a centralized exchange, it's way too many steps. And these are two high market cap tokens that should be pretty easy to exchange. That's why people use Binance. Um, and so it should be very much for a user as simple as, I want to trade ETH for Solana, and you don't have to think about any of those steps. It's all done in the same wallet. You don't have to worry about, oh, which bridge am I going to use, which security of this bridge, all of these different things. So I think what it comes down to for me is establishing standards. And I think for bridging, IBC, in my opinion, seems to be the best standard because you're not adding all of these trust assumptions to do that. You're just like, okay, I'm going to trust the consensus of the two bridges being connected, and that's, I'm, 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 happy, I'm happy with that. And so I think, there's a lot of work to be done under, under the hood, and that's where orchestration, in my mind, comes in. And whether it's bridging, whether it's wallets, whether it's just how apps interact with one another, there is a lot to be done. And so I think we're a ways away, but 
the last thing I'll say is like, I think a lot of it comes down to front ends and the way that we design front ends. Again, like today front ends are very much designed to be, this is how I'm gonna do something, not what I wanna do. And so when you think about like how aggregation theory works, which like pulls out all of these different underlying complexities and gives you a single platform to be like, this is what I wanna do, not how I wanna do it. What Dean was saying, like it shouldn't be like I wanna use Ave, Osmosis, Wormhole, IBC, et cetera. It should be, I just want to do this, give me the best route to do it, and I'm a happy person. So I'm not sure that directly answered your question, but I think there's a lot of different complexities that go into like actually allowing this to take place. Yeah, and I think um, what you mentioned quite well is IBC handles this orchestration part, like the back end that it's essentially possible. Now we have, to, with abstraction, we solve the user experience part that um, even a couple of commands come so that we, for example, are able to bundle a couple of transactions and a couple of demands into just into uh, just click one button experience, uh, kind of. But uh, Jack, I mean, we have IBC, we have different rollers, we have sequencers, we have a lot of uh, different bridging technologies. So what is missing for the future <laughs> that uh, Dougie just uh, described? What is What is the missing puzzle piece that we are looking for? And maybe you can all add some, uh, something to that. Is there like a piece of technology, a piece of infrastructure that we are still missing? You know, I think that there, there's like, everyone on this stage is in their own way building some of those pieces. The orchestration stuff that Dean is talking about with the JavaScript SDK, that's critical to build complex multi-chain applications. What Carol's working on with expanding IBC to more and more state machines, that's also critical. And you know, there's a, I know a bunch of other folks in this room are, are working on the UI pieces to, to help knit this all together. And I think you really got at it a minute ago where you were talking about <clears throat> orchestration versus abstraction, where orchestration is for the developers and we abstract that away for the users. Thank you, Carol. We abstract that away for the users. And it, the purpose of IBC has never been to be a user-facing protocol. It's supposed to fade into the background. and. It, we're just starting to see those first experiences now. And those experiences are sort of like firewalled to a specific set of chains and a specific set of applications. But what we're gonna see over the next six to 12 months is that exact experience roll out broadly across the entire crypto ecosystem. And then, yes, you do have these islands of atomic composability, that some of which are very fast, but those are just that, they're islands. And you need connection between those and this is what IBC provides. In the layers that sit on top of the chains, the applications that own that end user experience, that's where a lot of the value is going to end up accruing. And the infrastructure itself is just going to facilitate those applications. And the infrastructure that does the best job facilitating applications is what's going to win. And I, I think that what we've built here in IBC is, it's got all the pieces. Yeah, I think from like the backend part, I think we can all agree on because I don't think that there's any bridging technology that is so neutral, especially um, like uh, IBC. All of the other bridging technologies have to do something with a token, with uh, with a multisig, with a company or whatever. And IBC just is works. It works with uh, light clients. It works with the truth of the other chain. So this is something uh, that is wonderful uh, to see. And I think this is the reason why it works so well, because it is so uh, neutral. But now, um, maybe to get once again back to the abstraction part, question for you, Carol. Um, there was like a blog post that I found super interesting, published by the Nier co-founder, Ilya Polushkin, and he said, maybe we have Maybe we have to agree that we have a lot of interfaces, but not true dApps, because at the end of the day, we have all of these interactions where users connect their wallets to a website or something, and then you have to open a wallet, but you don't really have a dApp where everything happens in one place. At the end, you still need to sign a couple of things. So this is like maybe a critique that we have to accept that we have to put a lot of work into abstraction to you know to reach the goal that we just discussed in order to have this super seamless experience swapping tokens back and forth without even knowing, hey, I'm using a blockchain or not? Yeah, I think if you look at current kind of product development itself, then usually the UIs really reflect the smart contract themselves. There's basically for every single button that you have an identical smart contract endpoints. If you truly want to like achieve abstraction, we kind of need a little bit of a layer in between there, which more so not describes uh, what the user's doing, 
but the end state that the user wants to achieve. And that's kind of where the initial discussions about intents are about, right? Because such a translation layer allows you to perhaps programmatically compose a much more complex interaction and then translate that into the actual smart contracts. Now the thing is, this is hard for developers to do. For developers, it's easy to reason about there's going to be one like swap function in my smart contract and that's going to tie to the swap button itself. And so a lot of the DeFi and everything we have right now is not intent set to whatsoever. Um, doing this as a shift in the ecosystem isn't really up to infrastructure builders, to be honest. Like these API interfaces themselves are almost up to the product builders. So far, we see a little bit of work here, like across to some great work. Um, and actually, in, in Polkadot's ecosystem, XCM, uh, which is the bridging interop standard, has this intermediate interface here. Don't think there's that many projects yet working on this, but if you like, from a UI perspective, want to really achieve this future of this is what I want to achieve, this is kind of my end state, now compute how I'm going to get there. You're thinking about solvers, um, you're thinking about uh, chain abstraction. For this to, to work trustlessly, that's the most difficult step. Because really like saying what you want and then translating this into a set of transactions allows potentially for a solver to not translate it correctly and end up with gaining your tokens. Um, this is where I think ZKPs can actually uh, fill in a really great niche. Because ideally what you want to do is describe the end state, have a solver generate a ZKP that indeed by running these transactions, this end state is achieved, and then you can submit that on chain. Um, I think we're a bit far away from this future still though. Everything I see around here right now is a lot simpler. something so you know chain abstraction is that simple experience for the user we are really at, and and there is a chain abstraction day tomorrow that near is sponsoring agoric is sponsoring frontier the people who do flashbots are sponsoring so this is uh, you know to go into broadly how this affects the entire crypto ecosystem right chain abstraction and orchestration is one of the big narratives of the, of the next push but it's really important to realize how early we are in the you know in web3 a large smart contract is several thousand lines of code. You know, maybe as much as 10,000 lines of code. At Microsoft, I'm not sure I worked on any application that was less than 10 million lines of code. Right? Re applications that people use every day are three orders of magnitude larger than the largest program that people deploy on smart contracts. That's not an indictment of either side. That's just we, we are very, very early in the richness that we will be able to provide people with this blockchain technology. And we need the tools, we need the environment, and we need all the developers out there in order to, to, to be able to drive this forward. So, so in terms of you know, chain abstraction is absolutely a vision, um, uh, but, but what it takes to build it is, the, is sort of the next, the next wave, and that'll get us the next wave of applications and smart contracts. Yeah, I think one thing to add to what Karel was saying, which is like how far we are from this. Like from a liquidity standpoint, a gas standpoint, an easy example is if you actually want to have a solver-based intent system, right now to do that in a chain abstraction way, a solver would have to carry inventory for every single chain that they want to actually allow someone to transact with, which is a complete mess. And so from a liquidity standpoint, we need to have actually unified pools that solvers can like seamlessly tap into so that, we will go back to the same example, swapping ETH for Solana doesn't require a solver to hold both of those things and now take on risk. And so it's like a small microcosm of, I think, a pretty obvious solution that today does not exist. And so I encourage everyone here to think about like all these details that would actually enable this chain abstracted future that I think we all believe in. Yeah, we got closer to calling out some timelines here. So I want to stick to that. So in like maybe in the comparison of the development of the internet and all of its applications, um, Jack, what do you think? Where are we in this development to get closer? Like, yeah, I know that's a $1 million question, but what's your like general assumption? Where, where are we right now? And where do we have to put more efforts into uh, more into abstraction, more into orchestration. Is it a combination of both? We will see a merge of both. So, yeah, you know, I, th I think what really matters at the end of the day is bringing users in. And like, what do users want? They want clean user experiences. So, what do we need more of? We need clean user experiences that users actually get a lot of utility out of. And you know, with prices coming up again we have another opportunity as an industry to get the work that we've done in front of a lot of new eyes. And I think focusing on the one thing that you want your product to do, making sure that flow is super tight, and then going out to sell it to as many people as you can. And all of the, you know, 
we were talking earlier about how some of the stuff is for developers and for end users it's abstraction. What we're talking about here is fundamentally developer products in a lot of ways that we're giving to developers in order to allow them to bring in all of these users. And like, that's where the focus needs to be in this cycle um, because you know, with increasing regulatory acceptance in the US, I think we're gonna see a lot more traditional institutions come in and look at what we're doing in a way that they haven't in previous cycles. And what they want is applications that perform the way that they're used to in Web 2. And that's what we need to give to people. Yeah, I think that's a clear mission for the next two years. Thank you, Jake. Uh, with that being said, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, sorry for the one or two inconveniences that we've had in the beginning, but I think uh, we wrapped it up as a perfect panel with a nice and promising outlook. Um, so yeah, thank you, Dougie. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Carol, for participating. And I will give it back to the MC. Yeah. Thank you, Yuri.